So welcome everybody to another uh, seminar in our seminar series. And uh, today we have the pleasure to introduce uh, David Brapke to you. Uh, David and oh, more people come in. <laughs> yeah, so David uh, did his undergrad degree at Calvin College and then went on to get his PhD with um, with uh, Sylvain Ballou at um, uh, Maryland, University of Maryland where uh, he, that's when I first heard about him. He started writing a bunch of papers about galactic winds before we, all of us who had jumped on, on the bandwagon and started studying outflows. <laughs> um, and so it was really a transformative uh, work that, uh, that they started doing back then. And then ever since uh, I've known David as one of the uh, top uh, most experienced uh, people uh, studying outflows and on galactic scales. Uh, he stayed in Maryland for a few years with, to do a postdoc. And then after that, he moved to uh, Hawaii to the IFA uh, to work with uh, Lisa Culey and, and do a postdoc. And now he's a professor at Rhodes College where he is still very active in uh, outreach and uh, teaching. And he does a ton of research, which I have no idea when he has time to do. So <laughs> um, I'm excited that he has a picture of uh, one of the most largest uh, outflows that I, I believe are, are studied uh, to this day, Makani, which, which uh, I'm hoping that he'll tell us about during his talk. And uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to, to have you with us, David. Well, thank you, Gabby, and uh, thanks for that kind introduction. And um, it's fun to, to uh, I'm glad that you invited me, and I'm really pleased to be to be with you virtually and to um, to see some familiar faces or familiar names, <laughs> uh, at least. And uh, I'm grateful you all are, are here today. Um, I'm sitting in my uh, home office today. I teach uh, on Tuesday evenings. Uh, and so I'm, I'm at home today and uh, our windows are tinted so that or they're not tinted. They, they allow UV light through. So if it looks like I, I have sunglasses on, that's why. Um, so uh, today I'm going to yeah talk to you about galactic winds. I, when Gabby was talking, I, I was like, oh, yeah, it has it, it, it has been interesting to see how this field has really uh, blown up over the last um, uh, no pun intended over the last you know, 10 or 20 years. Um, I remember when I was doing my dissertation work, it, it, I felt like I was standing on the shoulders of, of really uh, good work that had gone before. And so it's fun to see um, all the young folks, particularly who are doing lots of amazing work on this stuff. And uh, I have trouble keeping up with it all. It's so, uh, there's so much great work going on. Um, so a lot of it, which I'm sure some of you are doing, so. Um, so I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna talk about uh, some of the work I've done on galactic winds recently um, using integral field spectroscopy. And I'm gonna frame this a little bit around talking first about the circumgalactic medium, which I think you guys uh, know what it is, but I'll talk, just talk about some context. Uh, then I'll talk about the size of galactic winds. And then I wanna uh, also go into um, some of the new things we're doing. And of course, since this is an AGM seminar, I will definitely talk about AGN, but I may talk about some starbursts as well. So forgive me if I uh, tread and tread and in, uh, um, in those waters. So uh, traditionally, we think of galaxies as island universes, as Immanuel Kant uh, labeled them, and uh, you know, of course, we know now they're more than their stellar disks. But that's what we had to start out with, right? Um, and uh, stellar halo and then you know we discovered high velocity clouds um, surrounding these galaxies and their halos um, and you know we've come to see that they most galaxies host a supermassive black hole um, we began to see in uh, the latter half of the 20th century that there was stuff between galaxies as well so this is an image of a quasar spectrum uh, which all of these little lines that you see are from the Lyman Alpha Forest, which is um, gas that is being absorbed, uh, gas that is absorbing light from the quasar at lots of different redshifts between the quasar and us. And um, this is a very distinctive 
feature of quasar spectra. And uh, what's cool now is that we can also image this gas. So uh, initially we saw this intergalactic gas and absorption, but now using these very sensitive integral field spectrographs, we can see this intergalactic gas in emission through, for instance, uh, lime and alpha fluorescence. So this is an image, an amazing image from Muse um, of the cosmic web at a redshift of three. Um, and this is only just one image of, you know, lots of these things that are emerging uh, now. Uh, so this intergalactic medium, you know, contains, may contain 90% of the, the baryonic mass in the universe. Intergalactic intercluster medium. Uh, we've also learned that this gas is not just hydrogen, right? That it's en enriched in the intergalactic medium. And so these two uh, absorbers that you see here show, uh, show that there's oxygen in uh, these absorbers. And these absorbers occur um, at a redshift that corresponds to the redshifts of these galaxies that appear in the foreground of this quasar. Uh, and so these, uh, this redshifted um, oxygen is associated with the halos of these of these galaxies, these extended halos. Um, and so the intergalactic uh, gas and the circumgalactic gas around galaxies contains a lot of heavy elements, uh, perhaps 75% of the metals in the universe. And so the, this, of course, begs the question is how did this get there, right? Um, this is an image of a traditional uh, uh, of a well-known galaxy group in the local universe. This is the M81, M82 group seen in uh, ultraviolet light with Galax. And I picked this one because M82 is the prototypical galactic wind. Um, and so it's an example of gas escaping that galaxy and perhaps entering the intergalactic medium. Um, so of course, galactic winds are one way that these heavy elements could be re redistributed into the intergalactic medium. I remember back when I was doing my dissertation work, which is quite a long time ago now, <laughs> uh, even then it was, you know, I was coming into a, a field where a lot of people were talking about, okay, how did this stuff get there? And galactic winds are, are one way that that happens uh, or that that might happen. Um, and so again, uh, you know, just to reemphasize that these metal absorbers are associated with, with galaxies uh, that are in the foreground of, of this particular quasar. Uh, and, you know, we can do a statistical uh, survey of lots of different foreground absorbers like this. And, you know, we find that a lot of this is associated with star forming galaxies, um, suggesting that's, you know, that the energy that these galaxies are putting into their interstellar medium is propelling this gas out of the galaxies and into the, into the what we now call the circumgalactic, circumgalactic medium, but you know, eventually also into the intergalactic and intercluster medium. Um, and perhaps as much as 70% of a galaxy's baryons is in this region right around it, in, within the virial radius of the galaxy. Uh, so in this thing we now call the circumgalactic medium. And uh, that's a lot, right? Um, and so how do we, how, you know, can we see it getting there? That's the question. Um, a lot of the metals uh, in these galaxies may also be uh, in the circumgalactic medium. So this is, these are images of the breakdown of metals as a function of mass. Uh, on the left is observations and on the right is simulations. And the, the galaxy disks are kind of the red and blue regions there. And you can see that um, you know, that only accounts for a small fraction of, of the metals that are available, quote unquote available. And so um, a lot of these metals may be in within, you know, in the circumgalactic medium in these uh, warm, warmer and hotter uh, gas phases. So, uh, you know, this is our modern picture of the galactic ecosystem, right? It's, we don't just have island universes that are stellar gas disks. We have um, a lot of stuff going on, right? We have stuff moving out of the galaxies through fountains and outflows. Um, we have gas being accreted probably from the intergalactic medium. Um, 
And then, of course, there's diffuse, this diffuse gas, which is just, which is just sitting out there. Um, so this is our this is our modern view and in, in all its pastel glory in this image. I, I kind of uh, I like this this picture that that was produced for this annual reviews article um, a few years ago. Um, so stuff is out there. Uh, metal enriched uh, gas is out there in the intergalactic circumgalactic medium in the cosmic web, right? Uh, so if we want to uh, propose that galactic winds are one of the ways that that gas gets there, we have a problem is that most of the observations of galactic winds are show that these winds show these winds just on kind of very pretty compact scales. So if we look at the wind in M82, uh, M82 here, we can see that I put a scale bar up that's 10 kiloparsecs, uh, which is basically the extent of what we can see in any phase in this wind. Um, but the size of this group is, you know, 100 kiloparsecs or greater. Um, so, you know, what's going on? We see the winds at these small scales, but, but not at these larger scales. Um, this is a simulation which uh, just shows the evolution of a uh, current day Milky Way size galaxy with cosmic time. And so going from top to bottom, you see the, the galaxy evolving. Virial radius uh, is getting bigger as the galaxy grows. Um, and these different columns are the gas density, temperature, and metallicity. And what you're seeing is, you know, like as, as time goes on, things are condensing, but you can see a lot of hot metal enriched gas that's that's filling this virial radius, radius at the current time. And so that's that's due to the outflows that are coming from the center of the galaxy. And you can see that there's, um, if you look closely, that there's clumpy gas here, which may be part of this um, circumgalactic medium that's produced by outflows. So a simulation suggests that galactic winds should be populating the circumgalactic medium. Um, and we actually do see, at least again, on fairly compact scales at high redshift, Again, looking at Lyman alpha, we can see uh, photoionized uh, hydrogen at, at you know, substantial radii in these galaxies. Um, it's not clear that you know, where this gas came from. It's, it's not obvious that these are produced by outflows, but it's there. The gas is there. Um, and then if we look at quasars and radio galaxies, so this is a, a plot of the size of of quasars, again, that you know, integral field spectroscopy is, is really revolutionizing our study of these high redshift galaxies and their halos. Um, and uh, you can see that there's a lot of detections, many more than in, are just in this, this figure here, which is several years old. Um, but you can see that the sizes of these, of these uh, nebulae, these Lyman, Lyman alpha nebulae are quite large, right? They do fill, they begin to, to fill the circumgalactic medium. But they're not, um, they don't show obvious outflow signatures. These sort of, it's basically just showing, a, showing us that this hydrogen gas is there uh, in fluorescence. But how did it get there is, is still a question. Um, here's another simulation, uh, just to emphasize again that the simulation suggests that the wind you know, gets to these fairly large scales. Um, this is a, a Milky Way size halo again, and near the current epoch. And the radius of this outflow is, you know, 100 kiloparsecs, um, but that's, you know, still smaller than the virial radius. And um, but, you know, but also much larger than what we actually observe for the size of these outflows. Um, and so, kind of, we're left with this conundrum: is the outflows are there? We, you know, lots of work over over the years has shown that they're ubiquitous. But the question is, how big are the outflows themselves? Um, and so that's a question that I want to want to talk a little a little bit about. Um, and uh, of course, the tool that was in the title here, integral field spectroscopy. Um, and you know, we live in an era now where this is a quite a much more common technique, which is great. Um, and uh, in the optical, of course, we can use ionized gas lines. Um, such as H alpha and O3 is a particular, you know, is a, a particularly important tracer for AGN. Uh, and then in um, a, a line I've used many times over the years is the sodium line, which gives us access to the neutral gas phase and absorption. 
Um, but in the, in the ultraviolet, we also now have access to, to magnesium and iron. And, uh, um, and then when we go into the near infrared, which JWST will enable, we have not just the ionized gas, but also um, uh, warm molecular lines and, and, and other things. So uh, just to get us, just to kick, kick this off here, this is an, a, a, an older study using an older instrument, a fairly small aperture integral field spectrograph on the Gemini telescope, um, which was a workhorse for many years, but you know, pales in comparison, comparison to some of the, the, the ones that are in use, you know, the newest integral field spectrographs. Um, we, we went and looked at type one quasars, which are sometimes hard, uh, hard targets with integral field spectroscopy because you've got that bright point source, right? So we developed a technique that would allow us to subtract that bright point source and look for the outflow behind, behind the quasar. And this image here is um, uh, fairly pixely, but the idea is that wherever you see a color, we've detected an outflow, whether it's an ionized gas, and that's the blue or neutral gas, and that's the orange, or, or both, and, and that's the white. And you can see that the outflows we see in these nearby type one quasars are ubiquitous, um, which, uh, you know, it's consonant with our experience of type two quasars as, we, as we've looked in the local universe. Um, and then the sizes that we detected, you know, are kiloparsecs, you know, up to 10 kiloparsecs, but really limited by the field of view, um, by our ability to, you know, to really look at the, at the full size of, of the galaxy. Um, here is another example of a nearby um, type two quasar. And this is uh, actually a binary AGN. Um, it's a merger, Euler, I think one that uh, Gavin knows well. Um, and this is an example of sort of the, uh, why one has to be a little careful uh, when, when looking for outflows is that you really need kinematics, not just morphology. So this is a galaxy where a giant O3 loop was detected and immediately, it, you know, the question, you know, it looked like a bubble, right? Well, maybe it's an outflow. Uh, Gene Lung is a postdoc and he worked on this, um, this new data that, that we got from KCWI on Keck. And um, it turned out that this O3 loop was more probably an ionization cone and that the actual fast outflow in this galaxy was perpendicular to the ionization cone. So on the left is an image of the velocity dispersion in, in the O3 and you know, really high velocity dispersion. This is a super high velocity outflow, thousands of kilometers per second, clearly driven by the AGN. Um, but, uh, but perpendicular again to the actual huge O3 nebula that you see. Uh, and so it's possible that that's some maybe relic outflow from a previous event. Uh, it's not clear, but, but it's clear that uh, that thing was really ionized by uh, the AGN, but not necessarily a, a current high velocity outflow. Um, and we, so this was detected in O3, but also a really big uh, neon five nebula uh, and in other lines as well. So. Um, these are just some other examples. Again, uh, this business of, of studying these outflows with integral field spectroscopy, not just in the local universe, but at higher redshift has really accelerated. Um, at higher redshift, of course, it's more difficult because you're, you know, you're limited by spatial resolution um, and to some extent, uh, you know, the surface brightness dimming. Um, but, uh, but these outflows are there. Uh, so the, these particular examples, it, it will become clear why I'm showing these later, uh, but we have a, a, in the upper right, uh, an O3 uh, outflow at, at fairly high velocities at, at moderate redshifts. Um, on the bottom left is a, is a pretty well, well known type one outf uh, outflow in a type one quasar at a redshift of 1.6. Um, and what the white outlines there show you the, the size of the O3 outflow. And then at the bottom right is an example of another sort of uh, 10, 10 kiloparsec size O3 outflow. Uh, so these are, again, examples of, you know, okay, you're seeing this outflow, you're seeing it sort of 10 kiloparsecs scales. Um, 
what what's going on at, at larger scales? Um, that's really the question. So galactic winds probably exist on 100 kiloparsec scales, at least from what we expect from simulations. And you know, the stuff has to get out there into the circumgalactic medium somehow. But you know, where it's easy to detect them is really just on these 10 kiloparsec scales. So looking for some new measuring sticks, we need more sensitive integral field spectrographs. Um, and a big work, a big workhorse for this uh, for this work now is uh, the Keck Cosmic Web Imager. So it's got a really large field of view, um, and it's got great sensitivity. It was really designed for faint extended emission, for looking for these Lyman alpha halos, for instance. And um, and it achieves the sensitivity through using this really highly reflective slicer, which you see a, an image, a picture of here. Um, so I'm just going to talk about a, a few of the things we've looked at with KCWI and then how that points us towards what we're going to do with JWST as well. So this is an image of one of the galaxies that we looked, one of the quasars that we looked at with GMOS. And then just for comparison, here's the KCWI field of view, right? So there's just no comparison. Um, what, what you can do both in terms of field of view and sensitivity with, with an instrument like KCWI or MUSE in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and uh, I want to talk about uh, the galaxy that, that was on the, the front page of this talk, uh, which we named Makani. Um, I'll give credit to that for Jim Keach uh, for coming up with that and suggesting that that was, you know, uh, naming a galaxy doesn't come naturally, but uh, it's sort of like, uh, I feel like, oh, that's not something you do, but, you know, why not? <laughs> when, you know, if, if you find something fun, uh, coming up with a good name for it is, is, is not a bad thing. Um, and Allison and Christy were uh, were really involved in this work too. So I, I kind of came into to this group and uh, got to use case of WI and, and we wrote this paper. Uh, and um, this galaxy that we looked at is uh, part of a sample that Christy and her group have studied for many years. Um, and I'll be honest, when I first looked at their sample uh, back in 2007, it really smacked of of AGN driven outflows. The, the, these outflows in the sample of galaxies were originally detected using absorption lines and they looked a lot like the observers you see in AGN. Um, it turns out they're probably starburst driven, that these are really compact starbursts and I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but just taken now that we have this, this merging galaxy at, at sort of this, what, you would, what we would now call fairly low redshift, but what's amazing is that it's this really compact galaxy. And so the, the, the stellar um, sort of size is, you know, is, is, is a kiloparsec or so. Um, and then when we looked at it in the light of O2, we saw this enormous nebula. Uh, and what's, again, what's amazing about this is that it extends so far from the stellar light of the galaxy. And, you know, the, uh, and it immediately brings to mind uh, what we see in out, outflows in the local universe. So uh, just a little more detail on this. Uh, this is, again, the, the half-light radius of the stars for this galaxy is about two and a half kiloparsecs, but the, the, the half-light radius um, the, or the size of this nebula, the radius of this nebula is about 20 times that. Um, so it's much, much larger than, than the stellar light of this galaxy and really reaches that TGM scale that I was talking about earlier, which is why it, which is why it's exciting. Um, and again, I talked about morphology earlier, right? Um, the morphology can be really, uh, can be a red herring. So, you know, maybe it looks like a wind, but how do we know it's a wind? And so, um, Right here is the, the obvious comparison. This is, uh, this is the hourglass nebula, uh, the engraved hourglass nebula from our galaxy. Uh, and I think Christy immediately saw this comparison. And, and uh, um, But of course, it's reminiscent of, you know, of other outflows that we see in galaxies as well. What's kind of cool about this is that these are actually on the same angular scale, but incredibly different uh, physical scales, right? So the engraved hourglass nebula is, 0.3 parsec in physical scale, but Makani is 100 kiloparsec, right? So uh, it's kind of a f one of these fun scale, and I, I won't go so far as to call it scale invariant, but uh, certainly, certainly cool. 
Um, and uh, but the proof is in the pudding, right? The proof is in uh, what do the velocities tell us? And when we, when we look at the velocities, what we see uh, is really probably two different uh, outflow episodes. So there's a really high velocity, fairly compact wind. Um, on the left here, you see an image of the maximum velocity. So more blue is, is higher velocity. And on the right is the, uh, is the velocity dispersion. And what we see is that, again, there's a fairly compact region which is you know, focused on, if you focus on the kind of black contours on the right here, that's the high surface brightness region in this galaxy and high surface brightness of the oxygen emission. And this is a really high velocity um, outflow, but really only extends to 10 to 20 kiloparsecs, although there may some, be some extensions out that are a bit further than that, at least in projection. Uh, and then there's this much larger lower velocity um, wind. And I'm calling these episode two for the high velocity flow and episode one for the low velocity flow, um, in part because then when we line these up with the stellar population ages in this galaxy, we see that uh, there is actually a young starburst, uh, which is about seven mega years old. And the dynamical time for that, uh, for that episode two, actually works out pretty well in terms of the size and the velocity of the outflow that we observe. And uh, and then on episode one is a much older outflow, what we would maybe say is an intermediate age out, uh, intermediate age starburst. And this 400 mega year starburst, uh, again, if we think about the, the time scales and the velocities and the sizes, it all kind of works out. Uh, so it gives us at least something that looks like a coherent picture uh, in terms of what's going on. And then if we actually compare to semi-analytics uh, models, uh, those, the predictions from these semi-analytic models for a starburst project, uh, propelling a gas into the circumgalactic medium, that that actually, uh, it lines up as well in terms of what you would expect for the star formation timescales and for the outflow, um, for the outflow speeds and sizes. Uh, so the, our conclusion then is not only does it look like a wind, but it, uh, it also quacks like a wind. And um, so it must be, it must be a wind um, feeding the circumgalactic medium, again, because it's on such large scales like this. Uh, you might ask, since this is an AGN community, what about an AGN? How do we know there's not an AGN there? And in fact, if you look at the optical line ratios of the nuclear emission, uh, there's actually, you know, the broad component of the emission actually falls in this uh, region in the BPT diagrams, the optical BPT diagrams of, yeah, okay, that looks like Seaford emission. Um, but none of the other pieces of evidence actually line up with that. So the, the X-ray emission uh, is, is fairly low luminosity. Uh, we do observe neon five, which is a very high ionization transition. Uh, but the luminosity of that neon-5 emission is really low compared to what you would expect from an AGN. The wise colors don't point to an AGN. And if we look at the radio versus far infrared correlation, again, it doesn't, it looks like a star from star forming galaxy. So we kind of have concluded after a lot of, um, you know, I, I think the question with the sample has always been, are you sure there's no AGN? And, you know, Basically, we can't, for most of them, uh, we can't find them. Uh, and so we've concluded that uh, there are some shock models which will produce, you know, if you get the, if you get high enough velocities, you can get neon five emission uh, in the shock model. So, uh, so that, that's probably what's going on in this broad component here, even though it falls into this uh, formally, what you would expect for, uh, you know, the AGN region of the BPT diagram. Uh, what about these, uh, what about some other examples here? So that's Makani. Um, this is another example. Uh, this is at a similar redshift to Makani. And uh, this is the, um, this is the GMOS uh, integral field data, which shows an outflow at sort of 10 kiloparsec scales. Uh, this is an O3 outflow. This is definitely an AGN, it's a type two quasar. And then when we, uh, so this is, I've shrunk it down here for a reason. So then when we look at, look at it with KCWI, so here is the same thing, but with KCWI. And so uh, again, we see a much larger outflow. So this uh, more compact O3 outflow is really embedded in this, this larger uh, outflowing nebula. 
again, suggesting that when we look harder, um, when we look with much more sensitive instruments, we can see these outflows extending to these much larger scales. So again, uh, not quite as large scales as Makani, but uh, still sort of, you know, 60 to 80 kiloparsec scales. Um, and then, of course, uh, our next measuring stick is going to be uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, um, something that's on a lot of folks' minds these days. And uh, the, um, I believe when I last showed this slide, I've still got the, uh, <laughs> the countdown for the JWST launch, but of course, that's, it's, it's all happened now, and it's, it's in the sky, and uh, it's exciting. Um, so uh, this, there are two integral field spectrographs on, on James Webb. Um, I think you guys, most of you all are probably aware of this, so I won't uh, belabor the, the details too much here. Uh, but we have uh, the mid-infrared spectrograph, um, which has a medium resolution spectrometer, which goes from five to, to 30 microns. And uh, this is going to be really revolutionary to have an integral field spectrograph, integral field unit in this wavelength range. And it's going to bring, uh, bring, give us a whole new set of diagnostics for these winds. So not just looking, not just thinking about the size of the wind, although that will be a, the factor, but also you know, what is in these winds, what are the properties of these winds. And then the near-infrared um, integral field unit will be uh, transformative in terms of its spatial resolution and, and our ability to, um, to really zero in on these high redshift winds and what is the detailed structure and yeah, how far do they extend? Um, so I'm part of a group that's uh, called Q3D which is looking, taking a look at some of these nearby, um, sorry, not nearby, uh, a set of quasars at three different redshifts and really uh, honing in on getting high quality data on AGN outflows in these systems. Um, the PI for this is Dominika Wyla-Zalek, who's at uh, Heidelberg and uh, a couple of co-PIs, Nadia Zakonska and Sylvain Bayou at Maryland and Johns Hopkins, and then a whole, a whole bunch of science collaborators uh, the folks here, Caroline and Yuzo and Andre, are postdocs and undergrad and postdocs and a graduate student who are working hard on this project. Um, and uh, I want to talk just a little bit about uh, where we're headed with this project. Um, so this is these are the as I as I mentioned I would uh, tell you the payoff here. This is the reason I showed these objects is because these are the ones that we're going to look at with uh, with JWST. Um, and so there are objects where we know there are outflows present, but we really want to, um, you know, sort of see their full extent and also look at the uh, different phases of these winds. So looking, uh, looking in particular uh, at as much wavelength coverage as we can get with NERSPEC and MIRI. Uh, so these the three rows here represent the three different objects, the different redshifts. And the color regions are the settings that we're going to use for NERSPEC and MIRI. And so you can see for the lowest redshift objects, basically, we're going to get as much coverage as we can um, of all the different um, wavelengths. And uh, for some of the obje other objects, we're sort of having to pick and choose in terms of what, uh, what transitions we're going to cover. Uh, but we can do a lot with this. And um, I'm guessing that other programs are pursuing similar strategies. So, um, so for instance, uh, the ionized gas phase, we can get at using rest frame oxygen three for these higher redshift sources. And so again, we'll really, you know, things that we've sort of been able to see with the ground, honestly, things that are pretty hard with the ground is looking at O3 and these high redshift quasars is gonna be dead easy with JWST. Um, but now we have access to these, um, to these other transitions such as bracket gamma. Um, and, uh, we also now have access to these molecular phases. So not just the row vibrational transitions in the near infrared, but also the transitions that we saw with Spitzer. Uh, but now we can see them you know, with a much bigger telescope, but also using integral field, right? So now we can look at the transitions in the colder hydrogen, where a lot of the mass is uh, you, by looking at the mid infrared. So I think that's going to be really transformative. Um, of course, Pause are, are present in, in the mid infrared, and these will trace star formation in these systems. Um, and then uh, there will be a lot of shock diagnostics 
from both in the near infrared, but also in the, the mid infrared. And of course, some of the traditional AGN diagnostics like neon five um, and other things. So it's just an amazing amount of, um, of spatially resolved, highly sensitive information we can get about these outflows, not just in these near infrared, not just in these nearby systems, but also at, at higher redshift. Uh, and again, I, I know I'm talking, speaking to the choir here. I, I know that a number of you have um, uh, cycle, you know, GT or cycle one programs on uh, looking at AGN outflows. And so um, we're all excited about this. Uh, one thing that our team is involved in, so uh, as part of our um, proposal, we, we said that we were gonna produce a community product to basically deal with this integral field data. And so what we're producing is this thing we're calling Q3D fit. Uh, and this is based on um, basically a package of, of integral field uh, fitting software that I've been using since, you know, since the early 2010s. Um, and uh, we're basing it off this and putting it in Python and really optimizing for fitting, um, fitting out that point spread function, which for JWST, this is a significant issue, is how do you deal with the really prominent point spread function for bright sources? Uh, not just for type one quasars, but it's also going to be an issue for type two quasars. And particularly in the mid infrared, that uh, point spread function gets pretty crazy. Um, and so we're focused on how do we how do we find a way to enable the user to to remove that point spread function or to to mitigate it as much as possible. And so this is a technique that um, that we developed and applied. Uh, for earlier papers, but now we're also adapting it and trying to include spatial priors. Um, so this is definitely a, an active work in progress. We've been working on it for, for a couple of years now. Um, we have, uh, we're hosting a J webinar uh, in late March or early April uh, on the software, and we're gonna continue developing it um, for everyone to use, uh, and particularly this community. Um, so I encourage you to watch out for that J webinar is something you'll be able to register for, I think, by the end of February, early March. And I'm hoping that uh, this will be a really useful tool for, for this community um, to, to deal with their integral field data. Because I know that um, I think one of, the, one of the challenges of dealing with this sort of data is, is you know, it's a bit of a fire hose. And how do you, how do you really... Um, uh, how do you analyze everything uh, appropriately? And with JWST, there's a new set of challenges um, related to the point spread function. And so I think, uh, yeah, we're, we're trying to prepare for that. And so I'm hopeful that that, that will be useful for, for the community. Um, so I'll finish there and just say, uh, just kind of summarize that, uh, again, we know that the CGM contains metal enriched gas and outflows are a great way to put that gas there. Uh, you know, typically we've seen these these outflows on 10 kiloparsec scales, but you know, to have them polluting the CGM, they need to be on you know scales 10 times that. And so, with KCWI, with Muse, with more sensitive, um, with JWST, with more sensitive integral field spectrographs, we can start to overcome this and and start to see these uh, to see these winds on larger scales, and that they are having the impact that we had had expected. Um, so with Makani and, and with other examples. Um, and I'll stop there and, and ask for questions. Thanks, Dave, for a really beautiful and uh, interesting presentation. So uh, Stephanie. Hi, David, good to see you again. It's been a long Hi, time. Stephanie. Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. I was curious, can you go back to the slide? You were showing the QSO, the type two QSO outflow with the smaller view and the bigger view with the KCWI. Yeah, is there some more? This one? No. Sorry. No, it was later. After Makani object. This one? Oh yes, this this one. Yeah. Um so I was, I don't know if it was my impression, is the velocity flip the color scale? I was looking at red to blue and then it looks like it goes from blue to red the other way on the large scale. Is yes, that... um, this, 
Yeah. Um, I think I have this correct. Um, the I probably should have shown. I mean, this is the V50, which is a little misleading because it doesn't show the highest velocities in the system. Okay. Um, so if you look, I mean, it, it, it is true that in this particular nebula, the velocities further out aren't as high as they are in the center. Um, yeah. So you can, if you look at the contours closer to the center, they sort of line up. And yes, there is an etch here, which sort of appears to be flipped a little bit, but you can see that this particular color scale is not really capturing the full. Yeah, uh, okay. It's not a great color scale. I need to, okay, I need to. so I guess modulo the color scale. Can you, did you investigate, like if it seems like it's an actual extent, a continuation of like the, it's consistent, the velocities and. So, so this is a work in progress. So yeah. the answer is I don't know yet. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, this is, and <laughs> maybe this is a little bit of a, a call for help too. Uh, KCW has this issue of, um, and this is an issue that's been known is that there's a, a problem with uh, sort of the background between the two amplifiers and then the way that, anyway, this particular data set, um, I'm having to go back to, to square one and work on the data reduction. So <laughs> that's okay, actually where I, I am with the data set. So, I mean, yeah. this, this is real, but the, uh, there's some subtle issues with, with what's going on in the background that I'm wrestling with, uh, that okay. other people on this call may uh, have experienced and I'm, I'm looking for help. So <laughs> if you, if you have any knowledge of that. Yeah. Well, in any case, it's very exciting. Uh, I'm sure you'll, spending time to investigate further so i look forward to seeing your result thank yep. you marie oh thanks um hi dave it's good to see you again and i just have right. a really simple question how do you know mccallie is going to be interesting before you observe it how do you know you'll find that big outflow well it was a complete surprise um we knew that there was a, a small compact high velocity outflow from absorption lines, but of course there's no spatial information from absorption lines. Um, so I, uh, we're doing a much larger survey now um, of this same sample. And we see some of these nebula, but none that reach quite as far. And um, so, so yeah, what makes Makani unique? I, I don't know the answer. Uh, I mean, I skipped a, a slides where, um, you know, so, so there have been a lots of O2 imaging surveys that are much wider field looking for, you know, things like this. And again, Makani is fairly unique uh, in terms of its surface brightness. Um, I, I'm hoping that as, you know, more objects get observed with these deeper wide field integral field spectrographs that we'll see more examples like this. Uh, so for instance, the one that's on the screen here, it's, you know, bigger than we thought. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, and I have thought like, okay, how do you go and pick out these things? Um, and I, I don't know the right answer yet. No. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, Giacomo? Yeah, hello, nice talk. Thank you. I, I have a question. Um, I'm curious about the O3 bubble that you were showing uh, uh, quite at the beginning, uh, the O3 loop. Um, yes, sure. Yeah. Yeah, this guy. Yeah, this one. Yeah, if you can go to the next slide, maybe. Sure. Yeah. You will. yeah. So, um, so I was wondering if there are, are there radio data for this galaxy? So if you could check for the presence uh, of a radio jet, uh, maybe in the direction of the bubble. Uh, so this is my first question. And then uh, maybe I have another one, depending on your answer. <laughs> Yeah, no, this is um, this. I, I have pushed on this with my group. Um, I haven't had a time to, had the time to write a, a radio proposal to observe this galaxy, um, but I think it should really be observed in radio, <laughs> uh, just for that reason. Uh, I mean, I mean, it looks like you say. So, so one one thing to say is there is definitely tidal debris up towards the north. So that's one possibility is that it's just tidal debris illuminated by. Um, by the AGN, but it certainly is bubblish. Um, so it, 
that's very suggestive of some sort of radio relic, um, you know, gas pushed out by perhaps a low power, low radio power uh, jet. Um, there exists some very old VLA data on this, um, but I've not been able to get a hold of it. So um, if anyone in this group is interested in collaborating on <laughs> radio data on Markarian 273, um, talk to me. I'd love to, to, to work on that. Okay. No, no, I was curious uh, because, and also about this uh, perpendicular uh, outflow or, yeah, and uh, high velocity dispersion. So it's curious. And, and as I see from your arrows, uh, from the color of your arrows, it seems that uh, on the left side, it mainly shows uh, red shifted velocities, while on the other side, mainly blue shifted ones, right? Right, yeah. Yeah, there's definitely a, and if you look at smaller scales, you can also see this orientation. You actually can model the bubbles um, em emerging from, from the nucleus itself. And this is a, this is a really fascinating and, and interesting system. And I mean, there's lots of work on the gory details of what's happening on mm -hmm. even smaller scales. Um, but yeah, it's, it, mm -hmm. it's an interesting object. Um, I was curious because um, just as I saw it, uh, it, it reminded me of these uh, objects that uh, we, we are starting to find mainly in the Leoka universe, but now apparently also in, uh, in quasars. So these um, uh, perpendicular announcements of velocity dispersion, uh, I mean, perpendicular to radio jets. So yeah. I was wondering if this thing could be happening here or if maybe it's, uh, uh, let's say, simply, that the, since you have a, um, it, it's a merger, you said, so yeah. maybe, I mean, it's a really complex source and you have uh, outflows in many directions, so maybe due to something due to the, the GN, something else due to star formation, act, starburst activity. Yeah, it's yeah, and I, um, I, I followed some of the papers that you're talking about. I was thinking of Jarvis or what is? Also, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, Anyway, if you send me a couple of those papers, I'd be interested to, I, I have some idea of what you're talking about with the velocity dispersions um, perpendicular to the radio jets, but I'd be interested to read more about that. Yeah. Uh, David? Hey, David, I've seen you. Yeah, nice, nice to see you again. <laughs> nice to see you, David. <laughs> Um, I just want to come back to the the sort of the, the basic motivation about you know the connection to outflows and metal enrichment you know across the CGM. So yeah. I, I think it might be useful to go back to that Milky Way uh, simulation sure. figure that you had. So uh -huh. I just want to get a sense. I don't know if you, you you have a sense of this. So how much of that enhancement in the in the scale of the metal enriched regions? is because of the outflow and how much of it is because of the continued accretion of more metal rich satellites, uh, you know, essentially maybe even some stripping of gas from those satellites as the Milky Way grows. And so it's a question of basically how much, how much should we interpret the size of a metal enriched region as, you know, gas coming from the center as opposed to other processes that, which can also metal enrich the outskirts. Yeah, and of course simulations can track this, right? Um, I know the the simulations I'm thinking of are. I don't know if it was metals or not, but um, I know a few years ago Daniel Anglitz Alcazar published some work where he was even talking about, you know, you have galaxies outside of the the, the circumgalactic medium of other galaxies, but outflows from those galaxies are actually. Yeah. polluting the certain galactic media um so so you you even have this intergalactic transfer between galaxies which i i found pretty astonishing um so yeah i i don't have the budget off the top of my head like exactly what's what but uh, my impression from the simulations that is, is that a large part of it is due to um you know due to pollution from from outflows um, you can see that a little bit in this simulation. So you yeah, exactly. hear they're tracking, right? What's coming, you know, what's coming from the outflows and what's from other stuff. So, so here it actually explicitly includes the satellite winds um, and accretion from the IGM. You know, some of that is, um, you know, that's going to be more pristine, right? So yeah. in terms of enrichment, you're not going to get that so much from the IGM. Um, 
you were talking about, I guess, satellites actually coming into the halo and merging. And yeah, I'm sure that's the source of metals too, but I don't get the sense from the simulations that that's, um, that that's the dominant contributor. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I, I was thinking about this very same figure as well, because, you know, those satellite winds are essentially, you know, basically the satellite carrying in metal and rich gas and then it falling uh -huh. into the halo of the, the 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 galaxy itself right right but it's not but it's the satellite wind it's not the satellite yes. itself right so it's a different that's a different um a little different yeah. yeah yeah it's not like the satellites being ram pressure stripped or something and yeah. depositing yeah. that into the yeah mm -hmm. that happens in, in in the intercluster medium so if you're talking about the intercluster medium the budget's going to be different right there it's yeah, yeah. Dorita? Um, great talk, Dave, and uh, very exciting future data. So I'm really looking forward to seeing this. Yeah, um, yeah so I had a few technical questions about the JWST um, ERS program. Sure. Um, so what are the um, spatial physical scales that you're going to get with the IFU data and JWST on your targets? Yeah, so the dither pattern, I think we have a nine point dither pattern, um, which is going to give us hopefully spatial scales of around half an arc, half, sorry, 0.05 arc seconds ish in the near infrared, I believe. Um, and so there you're talking about spatial scales of certainly below a kiloparsec. Um, I don't have the numbers off the on the top of my head, I guess, at 0.44. Um, That's OK. I was just yeah. curious how. But we're talking about angular scales of roughly 0.05. They're not that different from Hubble, right, in terms of yeah, angular. Yeah, yeah. I, I just meant physical scales. And yeah. what are you going to get on these targets? But Yeah, I'm and, and you know, it's, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, with AO-assisted um, near-infrared, right? Um, you're you're getting you know i guess the angular scales are not super different um but you're certainly gaining in sensitivity right and then in the mid-infrared you know you don't get anything with with ground-based stuff so i guess it's really the you know once you get out of the near infrared in the near infrared you're mainly gaining in sensitivity as opposed to spatial resolution um whereas in the mid-infrared so maybe I misspoke when I talked about it earlier, where in the min infrared, um, it's, I mean, you just, all, you have all this information that you didn't have before uh, in terms of spatial resolution. Yeah. Does that answer your question a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was also wondering with the sensitivity, um, if, you're, if you think you're gonna be able to detect, you know, some of the faint corona lines that are red shifted into the near infrared. So you're thinking about silicon six or? Uh, uh, well, for some of your higher redshift ones, the the optical coronal lines. I was wondering if. Um, so like the iron line, like iron coronal lines, or? Yeah, so iron coronal lines, um, and there are a whole, whole bunch of you know, very yeah. thin lines in the optical. Um, some of some of which. That's a great question. Um, I mean, they're probably going to be pretty compact um, if, if they are detected. Uh, yeah, I think that would be very interesting. If, um, yeah, that's a good thought. I, um, I actually hadn't thought about that, so I, I don't know the answer to uh -huh. your question, but I'll, I'll write it down and think about it. <laughs> and then but, I guess we'll see what the data show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm speaking yeah. about what the data shows. And I want to let Stephanie, I don't want to take up the time, but I was curious about the the plans. Like you talked about that, Jay, uh, that webinar, um, mm -hmm. just the plans for data release and, and communication, because there are a lot of people here who have IFU uh, programs, I know, with JWST. And I was just wondering on, you know, the communication plans and um, well, so, so, so yeah, we're, because this is an ERS program, we have to kind of the, the goal of this is for folks to be able to be ready for cycle two. And so, you know, our data will be public immediately when it's observed, but our goal is to sort of have, you know, 
a useful data product by kind of before uh, some you know x months i forget what it is but it's you know a few months before the cycle two i think it's launch plus 11 months or something now in reality not all our data will be taken by then but that's kind of the goal is to have things ready for more public consumption by that point uh, so november ish yeah at least whatever data we have in hand at that point stephanie Okay, so this is a different question. <laughs> uh, yeah. On the general topic, you've been talking about um, the idea of having multiple Starburst episodes and each episode would drive its own outflow. And then you had a, one particular example with two episodes for the Makani, I guess, object. Yeah. Um, do you have already a sense or uh, has your team been thinking of how common this would be because my first impression when I heard some early results some some years ago I think with Alex Simon Stanek is finding these outflows seem to be a very special class of objects like very rare that yeah. maybe you find them by chance in this special time right so are you already thinking of um like how rare versus how common this would need to be to really populate the CGM and the IGM with the metals more yeah, like a so, extrapolating, yep. I guess, to the population. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Kelly Whalen, who is a student of um, Ryan Hickox at Dartmouth, is finishing. She may have submitted it already a paper on on just this issue. So what what's the time scale for observability for things like this? Um, so you know, this is and. and the short answer is is that you know it's probably sort of a, a short time scale event that you know occurs in sort of a more common context so you know that these are mergers um and they appear to be rarer than say you know luminous infrared ultra luminous infrared galaxies at similar redshifts um and uh and, and also, uh, I mean, you mentioned Alex, so he published a paper just um, last year on, on HST imaging of these galaxies. And so um, showing that in fact, they are extremely compact. So remarkably compact systems compared to similar star forming galaxies at similar redshifts. Um, and so this, yeah, it's, it's, and so, yeah, that begs the question, is it a unique type of object or is it a unique phase in the evolution of these, you know, sort of, and, and probably the answer is the latter, but um, uh, I guess wait for Kelly's paper to come out. It'll, it'll be emerging soon. Um, the, uh, also a student of Christie's is about to submit a paper on kind of looking at uh, how the time scales correlate with, uh, there does seem to be a connection between time scale and um well actually serena published a paper serena um marie marie's former uh colleague at rivers and gabby's former colleague uh, at rivers Parada is her last name yeah serena perota uh, just published um p-e-r-r-o-t-t-a just published a paper on um i'm looking at the ionization in these systems and uh you know there does seem to be a connection between i believe in their paper they had the 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 lifetime of the sort of looking more at the average stellar population age the light weighted and then that correlates with the velocity so there is information from other systems that this is a you know that there is a connection between the lifetime of the starburst and um and the velocity of the wind and then christie's student uh, julie davis uh, is about to submit a paper sort of exploring this in more detail looking at correlations like that so so okay. there's a lot in the works that's like almost out. But. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. So I'm not the only one who had that question. Good. <laughs> okay, and, interesting. Yeah, yeah I'm so thinking, because also I think it's in a sense it's almost easier for Starburst and for EGN, because um, you can age the stars, but if the EGN switch on and off, you don't have, you can't right. say when was the last EGN episode unless you could see like uh, these echoes, I guess. Right, yeah. Yeah, no, that's 
uh, yeah, I agree that that's definitely an issue. Um, I was going to say too, while I got you here, I enjoyed your latest paper on 7582. That was quite a uh, some beautiful images that came out of that. And uh, anyway, I just thought I'd mention that. <laughs> oh, thanks. Actually, I have a, I'm going to maybe poke you with some questions for neutral gas in this one too. <laughs> Sure, yeah. That's a separate, absolutely. separate discussion, maybe. But yeah. Um, yeah, I think in a kind of the bigger picture, I've just been wondering the relative importance of EGN episodes and Starburst episodes. I think it's difficult to do. I guess with simulations, you could make a guess, but yeah. just finding previous EGN episodes is probably the, the more challenging part. Right. But, well, like in, yeah. two, like in Marcarian 273, where it's like, well, this could be, I mean, I think. Um, you know, when, with radio jets, it's easier, right, to age and, you know, other folks, Gabby or Shabita, you may have more expertise on this, but, you know, aging, aging things with radio emission is maybe a little easier. But if you're talking about these winds, which, you know, may not be, may or may not be <laughs> driven in part by radio stuff, it's, um, but yeah, but like with Mercurian 273, if you could find some sort of radio relic there or, you know, low power radio emission maybe that would tell you something um, yeah that would be very interesting yeah that's why i want yeah i'm wondering if if radio jets are needed to also bring stuff very far um like further than 100 kilo per sec but maybe this is also another another topic yeah yeah <laughs> good thought so since uh we're five minutes past the hour i just want to uh just ask everyone to thank David again 